Good morning, adventurers. Today we are starting off our day at Mesa Verde. Mexican hat last night. It was dark, like so dark. There are no lights out there and uh, there's signs posted everywhere as you saw in some of my other videos. Open range, open range, open range. That means cows have the right of way to walk across. You're supposed to be paying attention. Well, somebody didn't and uh, they hit two cows. <sighs> It completely totaled their vehicle and a lot of us piled up on the highway. We were waving lights to stop people and we waited until the first responders came. So I'm ready for a normal day today. Not all that chaos. So we have made it to the visitor center and we are about to kick off our version of normal travel style. and picked up our map and then our information about tours and things like that. Unfortunately, right now the tours are just not happening. So we're going to instead take the scenic drive, be able to check out the viewpoints and just kind of wing it. I mean, we've had a good time winging it so far. How would you boil water at home? Probably in a pot or pan, right? But what came before the pots and pans? These kind of baskets. That's right, I said basket. You can see the baskets are very thick material and there's no gap. They're also a coated material. This was made of yucca, which could be found in the area around us, like in the deserts and in the high mountains. And then they were able to actually put hot stones inside of this to boil water and it not seep out. Talk about ingenuity. I feel like in comparison, we don't do anything like that anymore. Look at this. They have harvesting and hunting. And these are some of the tools they might have used. Hmm, this resembles a modern day knife. Pretty handy. More bones. They used a stick to dig instead of a shovel. How many times whenever we come to sites like this, we, we think of this right here. But in reality, we need to be thinking of the full picture. So we need to think of the historic side, but also the preservation side. As you can see, this is about the preservation and some of the field tools that they actually use. But from the preservation side, this particular plaque means the most. Now, here's a few names and dates. Number one, Richard Wetherill. Number two, Charlie Mason. These were the two guys who publicly made the cliff dwellings known. Now they'd been discovered before, they'd been visited before, but these guys are really who put them on the map. Now after that, they started really shopping them out to people and talking about them in publications and garnered the attention of the Smithsonian. But it wasn't until 1893 that they began really working physically toward making these a public park and I think that that was a huge step in the right direction but these guys right here weren't the ones who led the charge instead it was this lady her name was Virginia McClung and she really thought that people were gonna come and loot all of the wonderful possessions and take away the rich history so she rallied and pushed very hard and finally in 1906 it became a public park but clearly this park like so many others that we visited had that one person who was just a thorn in the side until something happened and we can thank them for that otherwise we may never have been able to see these amazing things this shows how stones were used as not only tools but also as building blocks now, preservation only goes so far. You can't fight nature. And since 1906, over 75% of the park at some point in time has burned. Not because of people or negligence, but because of lightning. It's very prone to lightning strikes. Look at this. Receive up to 100 strikes in a 24 hour period? Like, what? Why? Why? Okay, adventurers, we have a plan, but we have to go to the car and get some cash. While inside, they suggested a few stops along the driving loop to make our trip really exciting. So we picked up the books to correspond with that. So literally we're gonna have our own tour, even without a tour ticket. It's gonna be really nice. So driving loop, 
here we come. Now for anyone at home who is horribly disappointed that we won't be taking one of the tours, there are a few bonuses to doing a self-guided or driving tour. One, I can be with my coffee and not have issues. Now, while that doesn't impact you guys at home, it's nice because this shows that even if you're not physically capable of doing one of the tours, there are options out there for you. So I wanna explore these options as well. And then next time I come, I'll take a tour. I love tours. See that guys, typical entry fee, $25. But we have our pass. The views here are too gorgeous not to try to at least show you. So I'm going to try to work around the windshield which needs love today. See, the ugly side of travel doesn't always have to be something that's like a crisis. <laughs> Sometimes it's just bucks. The drive has some spectacular views and there are only a few pull-offs. So even though you might be encouraged to stop and take photos, they tell you you cannot. Now something else they've done to really protect people is they've made it a rule where you cannot tow a vehicle up here of any kind unless you're camping. So if you have an RV but you're not staying in the park at the campground, they ask that you park it in the designated parking lot. The same thing for if you have an RV that you have a vehicle that you tow behind, you have to park it. It's just kind of the rules, but I can understand why. These are hairpin turns, it's very slow moving, and even the RV who's in front of me looks like they're struggling a bit. Much like other parks, guys, this is not cell phone friendly, like at all, but I kind of like that because that makes you have to like unplug and truly take in everything around you. Speaking of overlooks, I found our first one. We're stopping off at the Montezuma Overlook. It's pretty windy out here, so you'll be hearing some nice, pleasant music while I show you the views from this overlook. Have some rethinking to do adventurers that wind is cold and so intense and it was blowing my hat right off my head I tried tightening it down no so I may get a beanie Wow Our first official stop is the Fairview community where we're going to be able to walk around and learn a little bit more about the area and see some dwellings. We can actually enter a few of them, but not all of them. So we're going to just kind of meander our way through and get our learn on. Does this remind you of when we went to go visit Chaco? Now this particular structure is secured, but it was originally created way, way back in AD 1000. That is so long ago. But this was the large house, which actually had 40 rooms, 40. So it was huge. This was the center of the community. And well, you can see why by how vast it is. Now, just looking at it, it's hard to see just all of the craziness that's going on and that's why the photo here is so essential. I think we went off-roading and I didn't mean to. I was following the trail. <sighs> so uh, that means we're gonna go back this way. I feel like we should only be hiking on really well-developed paths in this area. There are way too many heebie-jeebies that crawl around. <gasps> Finally, we made it back. 
I learned that one of those plants is actually called snake weed. There's also a rabbit weed, but snake weed. Just think about that. I can only imagine why they called it that. Now, this next structure is called the Pipe Shrine House. It was excavated in 1922 by the Smithsonian excavators. And they called it that because they actually found over a dozen ceremonial pipes here. So, naturally, that's a good name. Now, I'm not sure why the walls are only this high. It could be that the rest of the building is gone. I don't know. It could be that there's still some that are underground, but if you'll notice, the doors are just crawl spaces, tiny little crawl spaces. Very cool. I just want to touch it. Wow. Now, as we walk to our next site, we actually just learned about the Antiquities Act. It was put into place the same year that Mesa Verde was considered to be a park, with good reason. The Antiquities Act basically says you can't take anything from a site because that's a no-no shame shame. That would be such a cool way to see all the national parks in the old school vehicles. Oh, here's another one. If we look at this, we can see exactly what we're looking at whenever we look up here. And that's really nice. So we have two kivas and a possible third kiva out back here. Then we have what they consider to be a tower and then room blocks. So all of these little things where, where rooms were. The amount of preservation that they have here is so spectacular and it almost makes you giddy inside to be able to see these buildings that are so, so old. And even though we might not understand completely all the things that they did in these structures, it's pretty amazing to see and especially on a size model. I mean, we're in a society now where we feel like we need these massive places and yet these were tiny little places and they were able to thrive. Now, as you can see, this is what a real path looks like. It's pretty even. Uh, it is gravel though. See, there's, there's the gravel. <laughs> so, you can access it with most abilities. However, it is not an ADA trail, so sorry about that, guys. Haven't found one of those yet here. What I have found, however, is another structure right here. See, right here. It's a wall, definitely a wall. And our sign! We found the sign! Now this one is huge. It is 90 feet in diameter, so massive. However, they aren't fully aware of what exactly this structure was. Standing in the middle, this place is huge. Just huge. And I feel like this staircase gives a whole new meaning to short steps, long journey. This next stop has its own building and this building is not the original building. The original building is inside the building and I'm really curious as to why. Pretty exceptional guys. It's really well preserved, especially the Kiva. 
and this is where the fire would have been. Now after seeing that, remember how in the visitor center we looked at the tools that they had? They didn't have like a standard shovel like we know. They used digging sticks and their hands. This ground is not very forgiving. It's pretty thick and hard and really tough. And so can you imagine to dig the kivas how long it would have taken? Because I know we can't go in there, but had I been able to go in there, the kiva was taller than me. I am 5'7". So you're looking at probably 6'2", maybe. And that's a hole straight into the ground. We made it back to the car and it's finally gotten warm enough to just put back on the hat. We might even lose this layer in a minute. But back on the road we go. We're gonna go check out the rest of the driving loop. If anything is like what we just saw, this is going to be an epic, epic day. As you can see by the trees, there has been a fire here and that's one of those lightning strikes that we saw in the visitor center. It's kind of crazy to see how many areas currently still are in this regrowth stage based on more recent lightning activity. super popular place to check this out from the ledges so definitely come out even if you don't have a tour and look at it these ladies are amazing their art is so beautiful and uh, I can't imagine a better inspiration Whew. the wind is no joke out here at all it's very intense I had to tighten my hat I had to hold on to my camera extra tight and I'm still blown away also on this loop, the house of many windows. I have no idea what to expect with this stop, but there's a little viewpoint right here, so we don't have to walk that far. Next up, a nice little path over here and yet another area to look out. It's really cool to see that the structures here have been here for years and years and years and they're still standing. So we're getting to glimpse into a little piece of history. But I have a few questions. One, what made them decide that the cliffs were the place to be? Two, how did they bring all the materials up? Three, how is it that people discovered this in the first place? one is kind of small so it's really hard to see. Um, this is kind of interesting because some of those questions that we just asked are actually addressed right here on this sign. This place was actually like really named after this one person who did the first archaeological excavation of the area and so way over here there's a tiny little building named after him. How did he figure out that this little building was way off into this little duck off? His eyes must be way better than mine because it took me a good few minutes to find that thing, even knowing where it was. Keys are with us. We're going to the pit house. Now the pit house looks to be in another one of those enclosures, but instead of it having the windows all closed up, this one has the breeze flowing through. I'm not exactly sure the purpose of these buildings, but I'm sure it has something to do with the overall preservation. Here it is, look at this, AD 600. And here's our little trail. There's another one of the little trail guides if we wanted to find out more. And we're going here. here 
so you can kind of see what this is. This would have been the main chamber. This would have been the subchamber, antechamber, and this would have been one dwelling. So they also had surface storage rooms and then also a slab line storage pit room. While we see this, this is probably what it looked like in real life. Now that's a pretty interesting structure and it's considered to be one of the oldest structures on the entire park property. Now this particular family it says probably didn't live alone. They had other people who lived in their community around them in other pit homes like this. It's interesting to see the evolution of how they went from the pit homes into the Pueblo-like homes, the cliff dwellings, all of these interesting structures that kind of evolved over time. just came from right here and there's another parking right here for something different. I could have just stayed there and walked a little bit. Here it is, 8012 to 1300. So about 600 years younger than that last place we looked at. And here's our stairs. Well, if you'll notice, this path is nice and flat and they have a ramp over here. This one is ADA. And again, pit house was also like that. So sorry, missed that. one of my favorites because we can actually get a little bit closer to this one and see the detail as opposed to being so far away where we can't see the brick by brick this one you can literally see each brick and it's so so detailed and a lot of the area is still intact there only looks like a little bit of ruin around and then well nothing has a top but I'm kind of seeing that's a common thing wow now that we have reached this section it's like bam 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 they're all over now this is what we see today and as you can see there's some little walls that still remain intact but for the most part it's a ruin but this is what it might have looked like then it does mention that this is considered the second village and this is when they started using masonry versus the wood and it could have been for a variety of reasons but it became the standard and as you can see this is a kiva but it's like the Kiva 1.0 versus the Kiva 2.0 that we saw earlier with the full masonry walls. Okay guys, it's back to the car and on we go. We still have a few more stops and of course we have the museum. We are not gonna forget the museum. That's gonna put all of these magical pieces of today's exploration together. Oak Tree House, AD 1250. And I already see it right here. Here it is right in that little arch and it looks like it goes pretty deep back in there now it says that a common characteristic of the cliff dwelling homes are t-shaped doors and nobody really knows why now a few other signature things about this particular place if you look really carefully in the top part like right up here above the actual housing they had a whole storage section this was for all sorts of different items mostly food supplies things like that so they could stockpile that and because it was recessed into the rock it kept it at a nice cooler condition so it would preserve a little bit longer just up from where we are we're at the fire temple and i can only imagine that the descriptor of this one's going to be quite interesting The fire temple was considered to be a place of worship and also a place where they would have all of their public gatherings. It was kind of large and had actually a strip of like 22 different little units, kind of like apartment size, that were next to it. Those are thought to be the people who were in charge of taking care of the temple, but not sure. Okay, so we made it to the museum and now it's time to take all of these little pieces that we've learned along the way and put them together like one big massive puzzle.
tell that this visitor center for Mesa Verde is a little bit older than yes. some of the other parks that we've been to. Some of the displays look a little bit more antiquated, but that doesn't stop them from having this amazing, like, knowledge that's inside these little glass boxes. It was completely broken apart, but they were able to find almost all of the pieces and reconstruct it so that we could see it today with this amazing design. Here is another example, a completely different design, but still in this black and white pattern that was so popular. This next case is really, really fascinating. These are all the things that we can attribute to the American Indians or the Native Americans. There are so many different things and we're just gonna kind of breeze through them. All of these different kinds of medicine, tobacco, cacao, cotton, several different kinds of industrial products. I found this case to be extremely interesting because way back in the day, I used to watch a show called Hey Dude. It was on Nickelodeon. Don't judge me. I know I'm old. But on this show, they had a moment where they decided they were going to go without anything that had to do with Native Americans. And in doing so, there were so many things that they couldn't use. And they quickly realized that they had a lot of gratitude that they should be paying toward the Native cultures. So this case continues to go on. And we're going to continue looking to know just how many things that we wouldn't have today if it weren't for these wonderful people. Well, look at all those nuts. Pecans, sunflower seeds, cashews, maple sugar and syrup, beans, vanilla. I'll think about this way. How many things use those items that you use daily? Tons, cornmeal, all sorts of stuff. So if you couldn't use any of those items because they didn't exist, where would you be? So next time you're considering not coming out to a historic site like this, think of that one case right there and how much that we truly do owe the people who created this wonderful place in the long run. The Native Americans and the Native peoples in general just brought us so many things. So we need to learn more about that and we need to understand it because today I feel like we neglect to understand those common things that we probably should know a little bit more about. Okay, now that we have finished up there, I think we're gonna go down to the Spruce Tree House before we call it a day here at Mesa Verde. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day. It got a little bit warm, it feels great. And we're gonna end on a wonderful final view. There it is, right down there, guys. Let's see if we can zoom a little closer or possibly take this little trail to see it a little better. Okay, we came, we saw, we conquered Mesa Verde. And uh, I feel like we have put together so many amazing pieces, gained so many brain wrinkles, and now we're off to our next adventure. Where's that gonna be? I'm not really sure yet. I haven't fully decided. We're gonna do a couple little research maps, maybe flip a coin, and I'll see you next time, guys.